This is going to be a different episode of Modern Art Madness because with the series, I truly wish to explore not just singular works of art, although ostensibly it has been mostly about singular works of art, but rather to explore aesthetic concepts through the work of art, through multiple works of art. And here it is the approach to such a laying of a groundwork into the political importance in works of art that you wouldn't find politics in, or rather has an implicit metapolitics, but in terms of our contemporary political landscape, you wouldn't necessarily associate them with explicit contemporary political themes. But nevertheless, by virtue of these two paintings being picked by two very controversial presidents in living memory, well, I should say that pretty much most presidents in the 20th and 21st century has had some degree of controversy, but it seems with the sort of hypermedia, hyperpolitical and hyperreal landscape that we find ourselves in, where every presidency, every election, every decision over the direction of, I wouldn't just say America, but let's say the quote unquote free world as a whole, even though that is a nonsense term in my opinion, but let us say that at least in North American politics, the fabulation machine posits every single event or happening or political ev political spectacle as being the be all and end all. This presidency will determine the fate and the course of politics and society and governance for the next thousand years. What did Ronald Reagan say? You know, we, we're on the cusp of a thousand years of darkness. And well, maybe he was right. Uh, I'll give Ronald Reagan that he was right about. But anyways, this is two paintings juxtaposed against each other on the inaugural pics of the two works of art that are displayed by two very different presidencies. And to me, it seems that both these choices are very apropos for the types of presidencies, or at least the media and spectacle and cultural created picture of the two presidencies. These two paintings are very apropos. So it is a tradition in America that one work of art, or I think multiple works of art, but essentially one work of art is taken by a president, chosen by a president during inauguration day to aesthetically celebrate the new presidency. Here to begin, we have the landscape painting by Robert S. Duncanson, who was an African-American painter, especially adjacent to the Hudson School style of painting in America. Landscape with Rainbow from 1859 from the Smithsonian Museum. I believe Jill Biden was the one that helped um, Joe Biden pick this one. Trump, on the other hand, Orange Tiny Hands, picked the painting by George Caleb Bingham's The Verdict of the People from 1855, which historians say depict public reaction to a likely pro-slavery candidate electoral victory, was chosen in the painting that will be displayed behind the president's table at the inaugural luncheon. And both picks, well, anything that the orange man has picked will spark controversy, but Let's start off with the Landscape with Rainbow by Robert S. Duncanson. Here we have a very classic orientated landscape, on, not too dissimilar from the Hudson School painters. We have the sort of luminous light of the wild American landscape. We have all of the signifiers of typical pastoral American life at this time. But of course, by virtue of this time period, displaying works by an African-American artist. In some ways, it, at least to the people who helped inform the choice of Joe Biden's inaugural work of art, it is to display that even people who have faced immense hardship and oppression in America can enjoy the rural and regionalist sentiments of the American landscape. And of course, with the rainbow, there's um, symbolisms of hope and peace and so forth in a bright future. You can also, um, which I'm sure 
some think peace person has written. Uh, you can also read the rainbow into contemporary politics if you know what I mean, but I will not mention it for fear of getting banned from YouTube. So this was the uh, painting. Duncanson was born in Fayette, New York, worked alongside fellow landscape artist William Louis Sontag, who was, of course, another famous one. They studied the landscapes of masters such as Claude Lorraine and, of course, Turner. And you can see sort of the influence, especially in the clouds here, with Turner. The painting is um, of a about 30 inches by 52 inches. It portrays a bucolic pastoral landscape which resembles the old Ohio River around Cincinnati and Covington, illuminated by the setting sun and is seen dominated by green of the landscape and the blue of the sky. One singular rainbow, the men dress in plain country clothing, a hat and short trousers, is pointing out the house to his female companion. The painting has been compared to the painting Niagara by Frederick Church. And of course, this is of this era, one of my favorite paintings as well, the painting of Niagara, but that is a, probably another video for another time. And of course, the inauguration of Joe Biden was selected by Joe Biden to be presented to Joe and the, as the inaugural painting on occasion of the inauguration luncheon, an event that could not take place during the inauguration of Biden due to, um, well, the global happening of the past uh, previous two years. A bipartisan commemoration of the ceremony by both Democrat and Republican senators. And of course, here in the Washington Post, we have this article by Kelsey Abels. Moments after laying on its vision for a country with his, with his own broad, bold brushstrokes, newly inaugurated President Biden set his sights in another hopeful vision of America. Inauguration gift, so it goes through the basic information. A century and a half later, hopes have arrived again in the small miracle of having his work, uh, Duncanson's, the first inaugural painting by a, a African-American artist, black artist, displayed in space that just two weeks earlier had been desecrated by um, a certain mob carrying a certain flag from the South. So obviously the uh, hyper-politicized nature of contemporary discourse is of, you know, laid bare here in this Washington Post article. As, of course, we all know Washington Post being one of the mouthpieces of the regime. Duncanson's painting Landscape with Rainbow while living on the edge of another America in Cincinnati across the river from the slave state of Kentucky. Not unlike talk of healing from a leader who has experienced extraordinary personal loss or words about democracy prevailing spoken in the very steps of a recent uh, I-word action, erection. Duncanson's restrained rainbow feels solid, unshakable, we trust that those who have seen the worst when they believe in the better, their sentiments painted thick with experience have weight. The Duncanson landscape marks an obvious thematic departure from Donald Trump's controversial inaugural painting, The Verdict of the People, a crammed, cartoonish scene. The 1855 painting by George Caleb Bingham depicts a white electorate reacting to a political victory for the Democratic Party, which defended slavery at the time. In the foreground, a black man pushes a wheelbarrow, but Duncanson's work also is more subtle ideological shift from landscape paintings chosen in the past. Presented to President Ronald Reagan in 1985, the first inaugural painting, Jasper Francis Cosby's Autumn on the Hudson River, captures the raw power and grand scale of the landscape and the strength of human enterprise the Congressional Inaugural Committee wrote at the time, Duncanson's embraced the landscape genre to achieve a more complicated end. With tiny figures and enveloping valleys, his landscapes do not make a grandiose claim to the land, justified by the heavens. Instead, they ask humbly and humanly for a place in it. Now, I think that when you actually look at the Bingham painting, you see the masculine clutter of a bygone America. You see very much the thematic Trumpian themes of populism, of taking back what is once rightfully of the people. And of course, through this uniquely American vision, one derives meaning of all sorts of creeds and classes. Of course, the emphasis on creeds and classes is overtaken by the fact that Donald Trump has picked this painting Therefore, it is controversial. Therefore, it represents the opposite of the intent of Bingham, which is, you know, instead of it being a message against segregation, is now a message for it, and so forth. As it is written here in the Daily Beast about the painting, 
We reject the use, so this is from St. Louis University art historian Ivy Cop Cooper. Ivy Cooper, who teaches at Southern Illinois University, reject the use of the paintings suggest that Donald Trump's election was truly a verdict of the people. Very ironic for reasons I will not get into again because of YouTube. In the midst of the latest art war, neither side is talking in detail about the painting itself, which ha within its 46 by 65 inch size and rendering of the election day crowd invicts scrutiny. That's too bad. The painting is the culmination of three part election series painting that Bingham completed between 1852 and 1855. And it's the nuanced depiction of the American political process. I intend it to be a representation of the scene that takes place at the close of an exciting political contest. Just when the final result of the ballot is proclaimed from the stand of the judges, Bingham wrote in the verdict of the people, the painting lives up to Bingham's intentions, but does not, but does so by offering mixed messages. The men who dominate the painting have accepted the election's results. They show no sign of turning violent, but they're far from the embodiment of democracy at its best. Their democracy is, hectic undertaking in which those who take politics seriously are in inseparable from those who view politics as a spectacle. Very funny though, I mean, the amount of spectacles we've witnessed, but I guess you can say that Trump has been at the forefront of the spectacle machine in terms of contemporary electoral politics. That is a fair assessment, but of course it is the Daily Beast, so it comes from a very uh, biased, unfair source. And then the, the Daily Beast article goes to proclaim, in the verdict of the people, the forces that would bring about the Civil War are very present in the lower left of the painting, an African-American laborer, a bandana wrapped around his head, pushes a wheelbarrow. He moves away from it rather than towards the election crowd. He clearly is a political non-participant rather than a welcome participant. He is not the only outsider to be in the political process. In the upper right hand corner of the painting on the balcony of a building overlooking the street, a group of women stand by themselves with the temperance banner. As Nancy Rash has pointed out in her study, the painting and politics of George Caleb Bingham was identified with the anti-slavery cause. And so we have a diagonal line from each other representatives of the two largest groups in antebellum America denied the vote for those celebrating the 2016 election as well as those protesting it the verdict of the people leaves much to worry about even though it shows the peaceful election for bingham the years before the civil war was not the time to sentimentalize over they were like the present moment a time for reflection so donald trump's intention with the painting of course differs wildly from it being the celebration of american style yeoman populism to begin with but not to deride duncanson's work it's a monumental landscape painting it is unique and it is important but we do notice that and even the washington post of course they're gushing and glowing about this we notice this thematic difference between that and something as populist and in your face and the depiction of raw American mythos in terms of electoral politics that we have in the Bingham painting. The thematic shift is very noticeable to say the least. With Biden, we have the pastoralness, the sort of coming back into quote unquote, the rightful place of America, the managerial state creating calm waters once again. And America is now reflecting upon a time of placidness as opposed to turbulence that Donald Trump's inaugural pick invokes. Because the neoliberal order, the quote unquote, adults in the room are here again. At least that was promised. And the intention of the painting, not only does it hit a few key diversity points, not to degrade the painting itself, it is a monumental work, but rather it's weaponization at the hands of the current Washington regime goes ignored while the weaponization of Bingham's painting by Donald Trump is ever present in any article that mentions this particular piece. But apart from hypocrisy, because pointing out hypocrisy is frankly ineffective, um, the, the plague, the mental parasite of conservatives everywhere. But let's just focus on this thematic shift. The voice of this impersonal, neoliberal order delivers to you 
a vision of regionalist America that has any of its conflict and turbulence and true politics annexed from it. Instead, we have the politics of stasis. Politics is no longer wagering in the streets. Politics is quote-unquote taken care of. The end of history project is here. And instead, we are going to return to a state of passivity into a state of quote-unquote hope for the future that doesn't really provide the same thematic content. Of course, landscapes have very subtle thematic content. Landscape, good landscape painters for centuries have evoked even greater emotions than, say, mannerism. But when it comes to the context of the Hudson School painters, of the American regionalists, of American art in general, the Duncanson painting speaks to a particular form of America, a particular form of American rural idealism, one that has negotiated political ends. And now, like communists who talk about primitive communism, the neoliberal regime talking about the sort of saccharine sweet, glorious notions of returning not to quote-unquote tradition, but rather returning to a contentless future, an open horizon, an open landscape that greets you with a rainbow. It is a restoration, not of the sort of way in which traditional artists or rather traditional art critics or people who are imbued with notions of quote-unquote tradition. I mean, I know these terms I have problematized and critiqued in videos past on this channel and in essays. But let us say that when it comes to the place of landscape invoking the primordial, here it is taken by a very specific Democrat political regime at the top of the Atlanticist world order to evoke the sentiment of the ending of political concerns. It is a restoration through the rainbowed landscape of the linearity of all political, cultural, social, and economic life. The linearity of all things towards the cessation of political, cultural difference. But in Donald Trump's vision, America is still lively. America is still something to haggle over in the streets. Electoral politics is given in a chiaroscuro highlight, in a dramatized and thematized rebellion of the spirit. Things are very much not settled in political life in Donald Trump's inaugural painting. There is almost a spiritual comportment to both of them. They speak to the inner metaphysical, let's say, physiognomy of both administrations. They speak to values that both of them intend. One is rebellious and contentious and strikes at the heart of the very uniquely American form of populism. The other is idealistic and placid and restorative to the intent of where the regime finds itself in its most idealistic of moments towards the end of history. And this is why we should look at these pieces of inaugural art, because they are of a striking importance. Art reveals the inner character, the inner metaphysical physiognomy of each administration. It sets the tone at that very first act of inauguration, sets the tone for an incoming administration. And this is why we should look at these two paintings, the two very different presidents in very precarious and hyper-real times have picked. So this has been a longer episode of Modern Art Madness. This has been more of a quick, let's say, audio essay on contrasting works of art. But there will be in the description an exclusive 
Patreon-only video that is going to review Tracy Eamon's Pop Tent. Very Again, another very controversial work of art. So please go to the description. Please subscribe to patreon.com slash giant productions. It is only $5 a month to unlock content, but there are different tiers that give you different things, including some of my artwork and as well as a $3 donation tier. But to unlock content, it is only $5 a month. Thank you very much. As always, God bless. Goodbye. Thank you.